No expertise, plug and play portable power stations are becoming more and more powerful and capable all the time. At the same time, they still have some frustrating limitations. It's hard to just read the specs and know if a system will meet your needs. That's why when Blue Eddy sent me their new AC300 for testing, I spent several months running this through practical, real world and long term testing. I'll cover the pros and cons as well as some tricks I came up with to unlock some additional capabilities. Welcome back to Projects with Everyday Dave. Let's do some testing on this AC300. Full disclosure, although Blue Eddy isn't paying me directly for this review, I did not have to pay for this AC300 that I'm testing, and I do have affiliate links in the description below, which I earn some small commission on at no cost to you. So if you want to help the channel out, be sure and use those links, and I also have discount codes for this and other products that can actually get you a reduced price over what's currently advertised. I do my best to bring you actual real world testing so you can make your own educated decision on what works for you. However, I'm sure someone is gonna chastise me in the comments for sounding like a salesman because the system has some really great features and it's hard not to get excited sometimes. But it's not all roses. I ran into some problems you'll see as I go through the testing. The Blue Eddy AC300 has some unique characteristics that set it apart in the industry for flexibility and creative usability. Typically, at this price point and capacity, manufacturers have an all-in-one base unit with the inverter, charge controller, and other electronics packaged together with batteries. Then they offer expansion batteries to grow the system. Blue Eddy turns this concept on its head by packaging the electronics separate from the batteries. And I have to say, all things being considered, if I'm in the market for one of these systems, it's the elegant approach to the separation of the batteries and the inverter electronics with the capability of each one of the batteries being its own power station that really wins me over. I have to say, of all the power stations I've tested, this is my new favorite. I ran a quick DC capacity test using the 12 volt regulated output found on each one of the accessory batteries. Just for fun, I ran it twice at two different temperatures. One at 10 degrees Celsius, which gave me a capacity of 2.511 kilowatt hours or 81.7% of the rated capacity. Then another one at 10 degrees Celsius, which gave me a capacity of 2.547 or 82.9% of the rated capacity. That's a pretty typical output from these kind of units. And from that, you can see that with just a 10 degree difference in temperature, that can impact the capacity by as much as 1%. Just for reference, I could run my Joy Tuttis freezer refrigerator for an estimated four days on just one battery, or a little over 16 days with four batteries. An interesting feature of the AC300 is the management of DC output. It has an unusually high 12 volt 30 amp port, which requires an accessory cable to utilize. Then it has a 24 volt car adapter port, which is great for some higher power appliances, such as the cooler, which can utilize 12 or 24 volts. There are actually a lot of appliances out there that do that. However, if you do have an appliance that is only capable of utilizing 12 volts, you do not want to plug it into this port. It will fit, but it will probably destroy your appliance. You need to use the ones on the batteries if you can only use 12 volts. That being said, every additional battery you add brings another 12 volt 10 amp port for a maximum of 40 amps from your individual 12 volt ports on your batteries and an additional 30 amps from the one on the main unit. That is a lot of 12 volt DC capacity. I like to use my water heater as the load for AC tests. It provides a nice, consistent, mid-sized load and allows me to capture the waste energy to heat the water. The inverter is providing almost 1500 watts at 120 volts and 12 and a half amps. The meter and inverter readout match very closely. The inverter was completely silent most of the time with only a low level fan cycling on periodically. The end result was a discharge time for one battery of one hour and 48 minutes with a total AC capacity of 2.736 kilowatt hours. That's 89.1% of the rated capacity, and that is a great result, significantly better than the DC capacity result. To evaluate the long-term intermittent use, I used my full-size refrigerator for a runtime test. The fridge was able to run for 21 hours and 44 minutes on one battery with a consumption of 1.95 kilowatt hours. 
This test brings into consideration the AC inverter idle losses, bringing the efficiency down to 71%. If I maxed the system out with four batteries, I would be able to run the fridge for a little over three and a half days. This system is very flexible when it comes to AC charging. One of the really great features of this system is the ability to manually set the charge current. Thank you, Blue Eddy. The default 15 amp setting will work with regular household outlets and medium sized generators. However, if you have a very small generator or want to charge at a slower pace to balance other loads on your system, you can adjust it to anything you want, from one amp to 15 amps. With an optional 30 amp cord and a code from Blue Eddy, you can expand that range all the way up to 30 amps. However, if you forget to move it back down to 15 amps and then use your regular cord and a regular outlet, you'll trip your breaker and possibly overheat your cord, so you have to be really careful when you're utilizing that setting. First, I ran a standard charge test using the included charging cord. At 15 amps, the charge rate was about 1800 watts. It took 3.7 kilowatt hours to charge the battery in two hours and eight minutes, which is really quick. The AC capacity test was 2.73 kilowatt hours, making the round trip efficiency 73.3%. But I couldn't stop there. Blue Eddy boasts a 30 amp charging capability. So let's use our 30 amp cord and see what the AC input max really is. For this 30 amp test, I ran a dedicated breaker over to the Blue Eddy, and I've put two sensors off of my Emporia view that are gonna allow me to monitor both legs of this breaker so I can see how much load each one of them is drawing while we run the test. For the purpose of this test, Blue Eddy sent me this 30 amp cable that has an L1430 plug on the end and I installed a receptacle just for the purpose of this test so that we can confirm the highest rate of charging performance that we can get out of it. With the breaker off, I'll just connect this up to the input port. And right now I have it set to charge just one of the batteries and then I'll just multiply that by two to get the total charge time. All right, let's fire it up. Turn the breaker on, there it goes. Pull it up on the app, starting at 0%. All right, I'm looking at my stopwatch. It's been less than 10 minutes and we're already at 12%, so this thing is filling up fast. Not only that, at the nine and a half minute mark, the fan came on. Up until that, it was completely silent, and even now, I mean, it is really quiet. It is amazing how quiet the fans are on this thing. Most of the time, they never run. When I was doing the 1500 watt dump into the water heater, it, it didn't even come on most of the time. And now we're putting 3000 watts into the battery and the fan just now started coming on at a really low level. This thing is amazingly quiet. Well, it won't take long at this pace, so we'll check back here in a little bit. Well, there we are. We were able to fill one battery to 100% capacity in about an hour and 20 minutes. That is really fast. So if you need to charge fast, the system can do it. Okay, so the actual max input is limited to 3000 watts AC. And from the Emporia app, you can see that we were only drawing power from one leg of the double pole breaker. And a closer analysis of the plug shows it is only connecting to one phase. I guess I thought they were using the four prong plug to take advantage of the higher 240 volt input, but clearly not. Even at 120 volts, it's only pulling 25 amps. Still, 3000 watts is a fast pace and charged one battery in one hour and 21 minutes. So if you had the max four battery set up, it would take less than five and a half hours to charge. If you combine that with the max solar input, you could cut that time down significantly. Using the data from the Emporia view, I measured a total input of 3.624 kilowatt hours, which gives this charging method a round trip efficiency of 75.5% slightly more than the 15 amp charging test. Let's say you're on a budget and you wanna start your system with just a battery, or you wanna go camping and leave your home backup system intact, but just borrow one battery from it. What kind of capability would you expect to have? If I charge the battery before I left, I would be able to run my Joy Tuttis freezer cooler for 97.89 hours, or almost exactly four days. But that's with no solar input. In that four days, you could expect to have at least some sunny days to recharge the battery while you're there, and that would allow you to pretty much run indefinitely. 
The battery has a 12 to 60 volt 10 amp solar input. To test it out, I connected my 200 watt Blue Eddy folding solar panel directly to the battery and plugged in my Joy Tutta's fridge. It's mostly cloudy out, but I can still get enough power from my Blue Eddy 200 watt solar panel to charge the battery, run my refrigerator. Not only can I run the refrigerator, but I also have a 100 watt USB-C port. So I should be able to charge my laptop. And shows I'm charging. Another solution is to use a AC converter. Here's just a really small, it's probably 80 or 90 watt AC converter. I can plug that into the DC port and then I could use my regular AC charger. And you might not be able to see that in the sun, but yep, there it is charging. The versatility of this battery is, is really incredible. Even though it has no AC out, a very inexpensive 100 watt inverter allows you to have some small AC output. You have your 12 volt output, you can run all your 12 volt appliances like the mini fridge. You have USB-C and USB-A. USB-C is 100 watts. I'll double check that later to make sure it actually puts out 100 watts. Um, and you can put in solar. So, and these panels, I mean, it's a mostly cloudy day and I've already charged up 20% in just a couple of hours. But it's, it was putting out when the sun came out a little bit earlier, 170 watts on a partly cloudy sky with just this 200 watt panel. Now the input for this is only up to 60 volt. So I could put one full size residential solar panel on it or a couple of RV style solar panels like this, like this portable solar panel. Those are usually in the 20, 24 volt range. So two of them would be 50 volts. And that's really pretty capable for something that is just extra. I'm pretty excited about the way they broke this up. I think it's really creative and adds a lot of extra use to the system. I connected this pass through watt meter for reference. Although it's not super accurate, it will give me a rough idea of the amount of energy I'm able to push into the battery. 160 watts, 162 watts, 7.8 amps. For another point of reference, I connected a 385 watt residential solar panel, which is giving me about 195 watts. That seems a little low since the irradiance meter is showing around 1060 watts per meter squared. So I connected the main inverter up to see how it compared. Okay, I was getting about 200 watts out of the solar panel when I'm plugging it into just the battery. But now I'm getting 10.4 amps, 350, 350 some watts, which is way better. So obviously the charge controller in the main inverter is way better. All right, now this is very interesting. These both have their own solar charge controllers, but after a quick setup here, it is very clear that the charging equipment in the main unit is far superior than to whatever is in the battery itself. It must not be a multi-point tracking charger or I don't know, something's different about it, but that 385 watt panel through the main unit is charging at 350 to 370 watts. And when I was charging it just into the battery, I was getting uh, just over 200 watts out of it. And right now I have this 385 watt panel and this Blue Eddy 200 watt folding panel connected. And the 385 watt panel is putting out 340 right now. And the Blue Eddy panel is putting out three, or 136 watts. The one thing about folding panels, it's hard to get them perfectly oriented. Rigid panels, you face them the way they go, every part of it's all facing the same way. The only reason to ever get one of these folding panels is if you really need the portability. You wanna be able to fold it up, put it in the trunk of your car, take it out when you go camping. It's all about convenience because from a cost standpoint, it's really hard to make sense of them. So what I've shown with this setup is, you can charge the battery Independently, it has its own charging port, so I can put power into the battery with one panel. I could have a couple more panels set up, putting power in through the main control unit and pu push significantly more energy into the battery at one time. But if I have both units, it's better to be connected to the main unit because the battery itself does not efficiently utilize the power that's coming from the solar panels. So, yeah, some neat quirks. A lot of unique flexibility, but you know, you have some compromises that go with it to achieve that. 
The main unit can handle up to 2400 watts of solar input to two separate MPPT controllers. I pushed one input well over 1000 watts with my small 1200 watt array of used panels that I have just lying on the ground. I used those panels to charge the batteries and run my dehumidifier to drain the batteries every day for weeks with no issues. One thing I noticed about the charge controller on this unit is it's very sensitive. As the sun was setting, I tracked the minimum input to the system all the way down to just three watts. That's crazy. Talk about squeezing out every last watt. Other inverters I've tested have cut out at 20 to 30 watts. Granted, you're not getting that much energy at the three watt level, but the engineer in me can't help but valuing, optimizing to get the very last bit out of the available resource. I'm just gonna use a couple of adapters here to make my way from this 30 amp output, which uses this style of plug. Then I have this orange adapter to convert it from single phase to dual phase L1430R here. That way I can plug it right into my home transfer switch. My home transfer switch is set up for dual phase, but this orange cord will basically apply single phase to both legs. So I'll switch off my 240 volt appliances and then everything else on both legs will run on 120. All right, now I've got everything connected up to my generator input for my house. So I can turn everything on. All right, before I turn the transfer switch on, I'm gonna turn off the well because that's a 240 volt load. And most of the rest of these lights and so on, they aren't huge loads. Ideally, I'd shut them all off first just so I don't hit the inverter really hard all at once, but let's see what happens. So let's switch the utility power off. All right, and kick in the inverter. Why am I not seeing anything pull? Oh, I know why. Uh, I need to turn the AC on. Boom, on. Ooh, lights came on. And we're pulling 65 watts. Oh, 380, 390. Aha, it works. So lights are powered on through all the different emergency circuits that are running. We are pulling a little over 400 watts right now. And that was the MultiPlus that just kicked on because its sub panel actually resides as a subsidiary of this one. So um, all of that is running off of the Blue Eddy right now. So let's go see if I can run the microwave and some other things throughout the house. And uh, yeah, so here's the thing. Like if I wanted to run the well, I would need two of these units so that I could create a split phase setup. And I've done that on previous videos with other systems and it works all right. But with just one unit, you can still run most things. I won't be able to run my well, but I can run all of the other things on my emergency panel. So let's go try some of them out. All right, I don't expect to have any problems with the microwave, but let's give it a shot. Put a glass of water in there for a couple minutes. And on the app, I can see the power jumping up. 1.6 kilowatts, 2.3 kilowatts. Lots of things running besides the microwave and it's running it with no problem. I'll let that carry on for a minute and go check and see if the inverter fans are kicking on. And it's still completely silent out here. Not even a fan is kicked on. We are running uh, 22, almost 2300 watts at 120 volt output, no sag in the voltage and exactly 60 Hertz. This thing runs really smoothly. I mean, it's a, only a 3000 watt inverter and I'm pushing a huge percentage of its output, but the fans haven't even kicked on. As far as quiet goes, this system is the quietest system I have ever tested. Even under pretty significant loads, the fans are either not on or run at a very low level, which is something that I really like about it because loud fans are really annoying. Well, let's see, the microwave should be almost done. No problem there. All right, well, it's still connected up to my transfer switch. I think it's a good time to see if I can overload it. Now, I don't have enough loads on my emergency circuit to overload this. So 
since my Victron inverter is connected to this, I can charge these batteries and I can set the amount of load that it pulls. So I'll start with 25 amps and we'll see uh, how this handles it and then we'll bump it up until it overloads. Okay. Charge those guys. Whoa, 2200 watts. That is more than I expected to be pulling. All right, well, let's end the heat gun. See if I can bump that up. That's interesting. Lights are flickering. Doesn't like that. Hmm. Looks like the voltage is fluctuating a little bit. Let's crank it up. So now I'm getting a warning because I'm over power. 3.4 kilowatts. Let's see how long it will run like that. Overload warning. <clears throat> Quite a while, apparently. There's a strange spot there at like 2200 watts. The lights were flickering a little bit, but when I bumped the load up over three kilowatts, it's smoothed out. I'm not sure why. Oh, I heard a fan just kick on. The Victron fan kicked on because it's charging batteries. And it is running a long time. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Wow, that was a long run. Finally kicked out. Let's see what alarm what got. Overload protection. Well, that was, that was pretty good. 3,400 watts for quite a while. I'll put the total time that it finally ran up on the screen. But you know, it's only rated for 3,000 watts. Well, I think that was a pretty good result. Well over the rated 3,000 watts. We went 3,400 watts for quite a while there. Now at 2300 watts or so there was a little bit of lights flickering i'm not sure exactly why that was the voltage was was jumping up and down a volt or two it wasn't dramatic the frequency looked okay on the machine uh, maybe if i attached an oscilloscope i could see if the sine wave was having some issues but interestingly once i pushed it up to 3000 and then up over 3000 watts 3400 watts it smoothed out and seemed to run even even better at the higher load and I ran that for quite a while and the fans just barely kicked on. So the, what shut it down was just its long-term overload protection. So I, I think that shows that it is capable of putting out 3000 watts, no problem. And even if you overload it for a period of time, it can handle the overload. So it, it is truly achieving its rated capacity. Now I'm kind of curious how far I can actually push it at least for just, just a short period of time, if I just run it all the way up. What is the threshold to immediately shut it off? Let's see what we can do here. Okay, we got 1500 watts. This will give us 3000. 2500. I'll add this guy. Thirty seven hundred and fifty eight watts. <laughs> it still wasn't enough to shut it down. All right, hang on. I, I got to find some more loads here. I'm going to I'm going to turn the emergency power back on again here. Turn these on. I'm going to switch this over. All right, twenty one hundred watts. Let's throw the heater on.
38. Oh, that shut off really quickly that time. All right, so like around 3,800 watts, it immediately shut off because I was able to do it to 3,700 watts and it was hanging on like a trooper. We got to 3,800 and it shut off. So still that's 800 watts over its rated capacity before it shuts down. I, I would say that's pretty capable. Well, everyone wants to see power tools. So let's go to the shop and do some regular work. My friend Steve has quite a few cherry boards here. We want to plane down from three quarter to half inch. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to run the Blue Eddy through its paces. I'm gonna connect the dust collector and the planer at the same time. And we'll see if it can handle it. So let's give it a try. So let's see what the dust collector does. Ha! Ah. Nope. It said no, too much. Huh. So I guess we can't run the dust collector. Well, we'll try just the planer. The one and a half horsepower large induction motors on some of these bigger tools are very hard to start. They draw significant amounts of current at startup with peaks approaching 100 amps. And the inverter basically reads that as a short circuit. The planer, however, starts and runs no problem. We were able to plane all the boards from three quarter to half inch using less than 10% of the battery. The unit ran in the 2000 watt range most of the time but there were some times when I pushed it a bit to nearly 3,400 watts, well above the 3,000 watt rating. But it was for a short enough time the system powered through without a hitch. Keep in mind, 3,400 watts would be about 28 amps. That's enough to trip my 20 amp household circuit breaker, which I regularly do when I'm running my planer. Moment of truth here. No! Oh. <laughs> Almost. Did it that time. Huh. Well, let's see what happens. To get a better understanding of what's happening, I monitored the inrush current with my fluke meter for the drum sander on mains power. I got a peak input of almost 98 amps, which explains why the inverter kept faulting out. Even though I did get it to start once and that's what we used to sand all the boards, I wasn't able to get it to start again after that. I've been working with Active Controls to develop a solution for starting my four ton heat pump using these all-in-one inverters in dual phase mode, which after several iterations, we are very close to solving it. The last unit that they sent me actually was able to start the system using the inverters. Once we have a solution, I'll let you know. They also have a plug-in solution for soft starting heavy loads like AC units for small generators and inverters. So I thought I would try that on these power tools and see if it helped us out any. On mains power with no assist, you can see the peak current is 97.8 amps. When I put the 20 amp active start in line with the sander, I was able to drop the peak starting current for the drum sander from 98 amps to 64 amps. In order to do that, I use the power pedestal setting in the Bluetooth app that connects to the active start. That significant drop was enough to allow me to connect the drum sander to my inverter and start it every time with no issues. The dust collector also has a one and a half horsepower motor and draws slightly less on mains power at 88.5 amps. And the active start can only drop it to 85 amps, which is still not enough drop for the AC300 to run it. I believe it might be related to the duration of the startup load for the dust collector. It takes a lot longer for the motor to spin up those heavy fan blades. I know Active Controls is working on ways to improve the performance, so maybe a solution is coming even for the dust collector. I don't have any affiliation with Active Controls. I don't receive any revenue from them. They just reached out to me to try and help me solve some of these issues with these inverters. I'll put a link to their website in the description if you wanna check them out. Well, at the very least, we found the limits of the AC300 and Steve's cabinet turned out great. Seems like a success overall. I've been testing this unit for months now and could spend hours going over all the things I've tried with it but let me put it all together by highlighting a few pros and cons to help you make a good decision for your particular needs. Starting with what I think is by far the biggest selling point for this system is the ability to operate the batteries as separate power stations. If I'm going on a camping trip, I can leave the inverter and one battery at home to back up my fridge, my security system, and other systems. 
and then just grab one of the batteries to power my fridge and other electronics for my trip. Plus, I can add AC power with one of these simple $13 150 watt AC car converters that I got off of Amazon. Just plug it in and you're good to go. The modularity also makes the system a lot more serviceable if I do have a problem. It's a lot easier to ship back this much lighter inverter than ones that have the batteries packaged with them. The next big pro is the interface. You can connect by Bluetooth without having to sign up for an account. With an account, you can connect by Wi-Fi and control the unit from anywhere in the world. The interface has significant control capability with multiple UPS modes that allow for peak shaving and prioritizing PV over mains consumption for optimizing electricity costs. I use the AC priority mode to run the dehumidifier in my shop for weeks. I set it to run on PV as long as it was available and then switch to mains power only if the capacity dropped below 10%. That way I always had some emergency power available. To optimize it even further, you can use a timer to switch off your load at night so you're not using power when sun's not available. Another big advantage is really fast AC charging. If you have your UPS mode set to PV priority, resulting in your system sitting at a low state of charge in the face of an approaching storm, you can quickly charge the system up. With the accessory 30 amp charging cord, you can charge at a rate of 3000 watts and even faster if you have PV input. Finally, it has an industry leading four year warranty and the stackable design makes the system more portable and utilizes space more efficiently than a lot of other systems out there. Some cons to consider. If you don't plan to expand and just want one compact unit, having the electronics and battery separate is less compact and a little bit more expensive. The solar charge controller in the battery itself is not as efficient as the one in the main unit. And although the 150 volt max for the solar input is competitive in the market, I would like to see at least 300 volts so that you can string six panels together in series. Now, maybe there's a safety reason for limiting it, but it would greatly improve the solar flexibility on these power stations. And as you'll find with any inverter of this style, it struggles with large induction loads, like the 1.5 horsepower dust collector and drum sander that I showed in the video. Finally, if you're running the system off grid and you completely deplete the batteries, the system won't turn the AC inverter back on on its own once the PV recharges the battery. It seems like such an easy setting to add to the software. I don't know why no one does it. There is, however, a trick to get around that with this system. As long as you have an internet connection on a separate UPS, you can turn the inverter back on remotely from anywhere in the world using the app. Once the PV charges the system back up, you can simply turn the AC back on. And that's something you can't do with most other systems. Let's take a quick look at cost. The AC300 and one B300 battery is on sale right now for $3,398. Plus, you can get some discount using the codes in the description. If you want some level of emergency power but aren't ready to spend that much, you might consider the EB70S which I've tested in previous videos. I've been using this unit for over a year now and I use it all the time. When I'm off-site filming, I use it to charge all of my electronic equipment and my power tools. I've used it to run my orbital sander when I was working on my shed. It is just really handy to have around. We just got back from a trip to Alabama to watch Jordan's team compete in the NASA student rocket competition. We were there all day in the heat watching rockets launch but I was able to keep the food and drinks cold by running my refrigerated cooler on the EB70S. It's only $600 and it's something that you'll probably use all the time. Even after you get a whole home system, it's still convenient to take this small portable system anywhere you go or anytime you need some power away from your house. You can find discount codes for Blue Eddy in the description as well as lots of other helpful content on off-grid and grid tie, home backup, and solar systems, like these videos you can click on right now. You can also find helpful content on my website, projectswithdave.com. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.